Okay, can you see the regular screen, the presentation? Okay, great, thank you. So welcome to the University of Connecticut Brain Imaging Research Center or Burke's speaker series. I'm the host, Fumiko Heeft, Director of Burke and Professor of Psychological Sciences, Math, Neuroscience, and Psychiatry. Over the past two years, we've hosted a number of speakers, as you can see here. Um, this is not the full list, and most of whom their recordings are available on our website. And we've had about 3,000 people joining our series from over 150 institutions all over the world. Thank you so much for helping us make this event so successful. And we want to continue this even after COVID. And we started this a little bit before COVID as a hybrid format a year before this. We've have a, we have a fantastic lineup of West Coast speakers coming up after this this spring. Russ Poldrack, Kalani grill Spector, um, Terry Jernigan, and so on. And also in the fall, some fantastic speakers as well. So please do let your friends and colleagues know about this event and also get updates by emailing Lizzie that's listed here. Some housekeeping items, as you all know already, you will be muted and we usually try unmuting to clap before, but I think in the interest of time, because we want to stop in an hour sharp, um, we will not do my usual, very unsuccessful unmuting and clapping before and after, but hopefully Ido can get to see all the uh, participants joining today and their enthusiasm as well. Um, if you have questions, please enter into the chat box. Ido will try to answer as we go, unless it gets overwhelming, and then we will take the rest at the end. But we will have to end at one o'clock East Coast time sharp. So let's get started. Today is my greatest pleasure to introduce very, our very own and newest faculty from uh, University of Connecticut, Professor Ido Davidesco. He is Assistant Professor of Learning Sciences at the University of Connecticut's NIAG School of Education. Ido completed his PhD at Hebrew University of Jerusalem with Professor Rafael Malak. Also, I think Kalini Grill Spector's uh, supervisor as well, many, many years ago. And after his PhD, he did his postdoc at Princeton as well as at NYU. Before coming to UConn, he was assistant professor at NYU for two years. He already has numerous NIH and NSF grants and have many publications that imp has impacted our field already. And this is reflected in his uh, recipient, uh, receiving the Next Generation Award from the Society for Neuroscience recently. He studies student engagement in face-to-face -face and virtual classrooms using portable EEG and eye tracking methods. Additionally, he studies how technology can enrich classroom-based research experiences for K-12 and university students. We're very grateful that he's here at UConn and a lot of people are enthusiastic talking about collaborations as well already, including us. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ido Davidesco. So I'll just clap on behalf of everyone, but you can hopefully see other people virtually clapping. All right, I will stop sharing my screen and please take the screen and start. Okay. Thank you so much Fumiko for inviting me and for this kind introduction. And thank you all for taking the time to uh, join us today. Um, so, I'm, I'm excited to share some of my recent work on brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, both in face-to-face -face as well as virtual classrooms. Um, and what motivated this research is that we know very little about the brain mechanisms that support learning in real-world environments. Um, in fact, this area of research has been dubbed the dark matter of cognitive neuroscience. And the reason that we know very little about this topic is that traditionally cognitive neuroscience research is done in controlled laboratory environments like inside an MRI brain scanner, which um, is clearly a very different environment than um, how learning looks like in the real world. So the goal of my research is to take neuroscience research um, outside of the laboratory box into a more ecologically valid environment where students and teachers uh, can interact with one another. And um, I, I find it helpful to think about this type of interactions between students and teachers in terms of joint attention. Joint attention refers to our ability to coordinate our attention with a social partner. It's really important to our development, but it, it's really um, critical in classroom learning. Um, I'm sure that many of you have heard the sentence, all eyes on me from your um, school teachers. And when a teacher says all eyes on me, they're basically directing their students' attention to themselves or to another 
object in the environment. Um, and the question that I would like to address today is, um, can we think about joint attention in terms of synchronized brain activity between students and teachers? In other words, do synchronized brain activity patterns between students and teachers reflect how attentive students are in a, either a face-to-face -face or a virtual classroom and how much they learn? Um, so this is the outline of the talk. Um, so I'll start by um, briefly uh, providing an overview of, of three recent studies that my colleagues and I conducted um, in face-to-face -face classrooms, where we looked at student engagement, learning outcomes, and more recently at collaborative learning. This is still an ongoing study. Um, and then I'll switch to talk more about student engagement in virtual learning environments, which are clearly very relevant to um, this time and age. Um, and I'll try to conclude by some thoughts on um, neuroscience and education more broadly. And um, is it still a bridge too far as has been argued in the past? So to conduct this kind of research, we clearly cannot use a, a big expensive bulky MRI brain scanner, but luckily in recent years, um, portable brain technology, specifically portable EEG, um, has become much more commonly used. Um, so these are some examples of the EEG devices that we use in classrooms. Um, these are relatively low cost devices. They have a much fewer channels than what you'll find in a traditional laboratory based EEG system. Um, so the current uh, um, system that we use has a 32 EEG channels. The signal to noise might not be as good, um, but uh, we can bring these devices into a classroom, which is exactly what um, my colleagues and I at NYU did a few years ago for the first time, um, as you can see in this video. So this video was taken in a high school biology classroom uh, in New York City. Uh, and as you see, the lesson started by students setting up the EEG devices. They were able to visualize their brain activity on the computer screen, which was a very engaging experience for them. And once everyone was set up, we started collecting brain data from the students and their teacher. At first, just some baseline data, as you see here when they were sitting quietly. Um, but then we looked at um, different teaching activities. Um, it, like the teacher reading aloud from their lecture notes, presenting a short instructional video, uh, leading a lecture, or uh, facilitating a group discussion. Um, and this study was led by my colleague, Susanna Dicker. Um, and the main question that we asked here um, was to what extent um, the level of student engagement is reflected in uh, the degree of brain synchrony between students. And that was really inspired by previous work by Uri Hasson and others um, who looked at synchrony across brains rather than just at individual brains. Um, and to explore this question, um, we uh, had to compute a, a brain synchrony between students. And I won't get into all the technical details, but I'm happy to take any questions about that. But very briefly, this process entails decomposing the EEG signal into different frequency bands from slow oscillations in the delta band to much faster brain activity in the beta band. And then within each frequency band, we used, um, um, we used a coherence measure to capture the synchrony between each two students. So each time we considered one student in the group and we measure the synchrony between that student and each one of the other um, students. And then we average these values together uh, to generate what we refer to as student to group brain synchrony. So student to group brain synchrony basically captures the degree to which a specific student's brain activity is synchronized with all the other students in the group. And that will be the main dependent measure throughout this talk. So um, to look into student engagement, we um, used a survey that it was administered at the end of each lesson, as well as the end of the entire semester. We measured the students not just once, but 11 times throughout the semester. And within each lesson, we had these four different activities that I just mentioned. And we asked students 
how engaged they were by these different activities. And perhaps not very surprisingly, students reported being more engaged by instructional videos and group discussions compared to lectures and readings. And what was quite striking was that student to group brain synchrony followed the same pattern where brain synchrony was significantly higher for videos and discussions compared to the other two uh, instruction activities. And importantly, these two measures were significantly correlated. That is, um, student to group brain synchrony significantly predicted self-reported engagement. Students who reported being more engaged in a specific activity, like a discussion, showed higher synchrony with their peers. And here's how we think about this finding. So when students are not engaged in a task, we see an increase typically in alpha brain oscillations that has been documented in many other studies where there is an in, typically an inverse relationship between alpha and attention, such that when attention goes down, alpha goes up. Um, and this Alpha uh, brain oscillations are idiosyncratic. They're not synchronized across students. And therefore, uh, under low engagement, we um, typically see low brain synchrony across students. However, when students are highly engaged in a task like watching an instructional video or engaging in a discussion, um, alpha brain activity is suppressed and that allows students' brains to become entrained to an external um, stimulus like um, like a video or a lecture. And under these conditions, we expect to see high brain synchrony between students and teachers. And of course, we still don't fully understand the mechanism behind brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. I'll share some thoughts in a moment, and I'm, I'm happy to open that for discussion. In the second study, we wanted to take a step further and ask whether brain-to-brain -brain synchrony between students can capture not only student engagement, but also learning outcomes. In other words, do students learn better when their brains are in sync? And to study that, we designed a, this time a laboratory-based study where we simulated a classroom, we invited four students and a teacher um, to come uh, um, to the lab, uh, and we had multiple groups like that um, over several weeks. And um, we also wanted to measure students' learning very systematically. So we asked the students to come a week before to take a pretest. And then throughout the EEG session, they went through a sequence of four mini lectures on different topics in biology and chemistry. And immediately after each lecture, they took the same test again uh, to look at immediate retention. And the same test has also been administered the week after to look at delayed learning. Overall, we had 31 students, this time undergraduate students. These were all non-science majors. So when you look at their performance in the pretest, it was quite low at about um, just over 40% because this content was not familiar to the students. However, there is a big increase in their test scores immediately after each lecture. Um, that was also retained a week after with a small uh, decline, which is to be expected. Um, so we were mainly interested in this difference between students' performance in the pretest and the delayed post-test, uh, which we call learning gains. And the question that we wanted to ask here is to what extent we can uh, predict these learning gains based on um, self-reported data and based on um, brain data. Um, and rather than just giving you the, the answer, I want to ask you what pattern of results would you predict? So we looked at three different metrics, three different uh, potential predictors of student learning. Uh, the first one was self-reported engagement. So just like in study one, we asked students to rate how engaged they were on a scale after each lecture. And we ask whether that predicts student learning uh, the second metric was interbrain synchrony. So we used the same uh, brain synchrony um, measure, but this time applied within individual brains. So rather than correlating brain activity across students, we looked at the correlations within individual students between different EEG electrodes. And as you see here, we focused on the alpha band, again, based on this 
prior research suggesting that alpha is associated with attention. And the third metric was brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, again, in the alpha band. Um, so, so here's the question for you guys, and I'm hoping that people can use the chat to answer that. So which one of these predictors, of course, there can be more than one, you expect to significantly be associated with student learning? Some people are responding in the chat box. There's some divergent responses. I like the participation via chat. We should put up a yeah. poll. So, so perhaps the title of this talk kind of gave away that three is one of these <laughs> significant predictors. But the question is, is that the only one? And it looks like, yeah, some people also predict number one to be a significant predictor. And that was my prediction as well. Um, surprisingly, there was only a trend, a non-significant trend in the data uh, where it seems that self-reported engagement predicted learning gains to some extent, but that it did not reach the statistical uh, significant level. Um, Intra-brain synchrony did not predict learning whatsoever. There was no um, significant association between the two. And um, perhaps as the title of this talk already gave away, a brain to brain synchrony specifically in the alpha band, um, not in other frequency bands, which was an interesting finding on its own, um, significantly predicted learning gain. So students who showed higher brain synchrony with other students also with the teacher, this is not shown here. I'm happy to show you the data for student-teacher brain synchrony later. But in this case, we're looking just at student-to-student -student brain synchrony. And it seems that that is a, a, a good predictor of um, how much information students retained a week after this lesson took place. Um, but we wanted to look a bit uh, closer at the data and ask whether brain synchrony can give us information not only at overall learning, but also at learning in specific moments throughout the lecture. So EEG, um, as I'm sure you know, has good temporal resolution. So we wanted to leverage that. And the way to do that was to look at the specific test questions. We had 10 different questions asked on each one of these mini lectures. So we could go back to the lecture transcript and identify what part of the lecture it basically was needed in order to answer that question. So for instance, one of the test question here was about a bipedalism. So we were able to identify that the critical piece of information was delivered to students within that specific time frame. So now, rather than computing brain synchrony throughout the entire lecture, we computed brain synchrony specifically within these time frames and ask whether that can predict a student's answers to specific test questions. And the answer was yes. So overall, alpha band brain to brain synchrony was significantly higher, oh, excuse me, for questions where students demonstrated learning, that is, questions that students answered incorrectly in the pretest and correctly in the post-test compared to questions where no lear learning was observed, where students' answers did not change. And I think that this is imp an important finding because it suggests that brain synchrony can also provide us with temporal information, not just about whether learning took place overall, but also at what time frames um, students were able to retain information at what time time points they did not. Um, and I'll get back to this point a bit later. Okay, so study three is uh, still ongoing um, and it's about collaborative learning. Um, so um, in, in the previous studies, we mainly looked at lectures and the reason is that um, EEG, as, as you may already know, is, is highly noisy. It's um, sensitive, not just to the underlying neural activity, but also to uh, muscle movement and eye movements. Um, and, and we found that students listening to lectures, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, yielded the, the cleanest data. Um, and that's clearly a challenge. And I'll, again, I'm happy to talk more about that when you conduct this kind of research 
in a noisy classroom environment. However, uh, after these previous studies, we felt a bit more confident in the method and we wanted to look at slightly more active forms of learning where students not just passively listen to a lecture, but also interact with one another. And this is an important question because it's supported by extensive literature in uh, education showing that collaborative learning overall is more effective than individual learning, but we don't really know what is happening under the hood. So how and why collaborative learning works and specifically, why do some groups fail? So we know that collaborative learning doesn't always work. Some groups are more effective than others. And the hope here is that neuroscience data can uh, generate some insights into uh, how and why collaborative learning works or does not work in classrooms. So here's how we tested it. And again, there is another um, audience participation coming up. Um, so um, we, set up this classroom-based study uh, with the local high school where we invited um, small groups of students and um, the students first received a quick refresher on cell biology and then we gave them some arts and crafts materials and asked them to construct a model of a cell. So for about 10-15 minutes they interacted with one another. We asked them to think very carefully about what objects they use to um, basically represent different organelles in, in a living cell. So I'm gonna show you a quick video from this experiment and ask you what you observe about the interaction between students. So, oh, oh my endopos God, we fully have to do this. This is the endoplasmic reticulum. These are the ribosomes. This is a nuclear membrane. This is a nuclear membrane. Oh my God. Wait, wait, wait. So, yeah, I know. Doing that for a reason. Should we use, should we use, so what do we have? We have the, the button as the cell membrane. Okay. So we need to put this all around. Okay, so I guess so. just the button. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, they can, yeah. they can understand can that you, the yeah. buttons were. For the nuclear membrane? Sure. So what did people observe? Again, feel free to use the chat. Specifically, what, what did you observe about the engagement of these students? Did they all engage to the same extent? Um, if you would be asked to predict um, the type of brain synchrony that perhaps um, um, unfolded over this segment, um, what, what, what would you predict? So, so I see some comments on how two participants, in this case, the two female participants seem to be more uh, engaged in the task and um, there was more interaction between these two. IB seems the least engaged. Yeah, what I want you to notice is that Clearly this is a very rich data set and just by observing at students, we can extract some uh, important insights into uh, the, the learning experience. Um, yeah, there was some time pressure. Um, we, did, we did give them a, a specific amount of time to complete the task, uh, different levels of engagement. But what I want you to notice is that just by observing at students, it's, it's a bit hard to tell what's going on under the hood, right? So IB seems the least engaged because they, they don't speak, they don't move much, but um, this is ambiguous, right? Because when a student seems to be not engaged, they can still be highly cognitively engaged. And, and there is no way to tell just by looking at, at students from the outside and, and the point that I'm trying to make is that that's really the power of using these portable brain technologies in classrooms because they allow us to perhaps, you know, we're still early on in this process, but perhaps to gain some insights into the underlying cognitive and, and, and neural activity um, among these students. So um, I don't have yet um, clear uh, findings to share with you. We're still uh, looking through the data. Um, but I do want to talk about how we can even uh, analyze this rich real world data set. So we do that by analyzing student conversations in relation to the EEG data. So in partnership with Sarah Kreider from Columbia University, we transcribed all these conversations 
and we look specifically at um, different features of student conversations, one of them being switching points between on-task and off-task conversations. So this is a segment of um, a student conversation that happened just after the video that I just shared with you. And here IB actually starts talking um, and they hold the pipe cleaner and say, there I made another endoplasmic reticulum. And a second later, JA, the other male student, picks up the figure. They had to record, take notes on the figure and ask, should we put the ribosomes on it? And AH, who acted as the recorder, agrees. She starts writing, but then she puts down her pen and announces, I'm so tired, I really need to leave. And that really derails the conversation because that triggers IB to talk about how much sleep they got the previous night and so on you know, high school students. Um, so, so this point marked by, by the arrow is really an interesting switching point between on-task and off-task. And the question becomes how this might be reflected in students' brain activity and in the, um, specifically the dynamics of the brain-to-brain -brain synchrony between these students. Hey, you know, there's a question. Did you want to take it later or? Now. Sure, let me just say one more thing about this study and then I'm happy to open it up. So Great. yeah, feel free to type in um, more it's questions. It's in the chat box. I'm happy to okay. answer them in just a minute. Got it. So just to complete this line of thought, so the next steps here are to look at how brain synchrony unfolds over time. And as you can imagine, when we look at this um, temporal profile of brain synchrony, there might be times where brain synchrony is high and other times where brain synchrony is low. We also have, as you notice, video recordings of these groups of students. So we can go back to the videos and ask what happened in the video at these specific moments in time. And one prediction based on uh, the previous set of, set of results that I shared with you is that perhaps during um, high brain synchrony, um, there might be a high joint engagement where all students seem to be engaged in the same task and when brain synchrony is low, perhaps there would be just slow in joint engagement. However, we don't really know what we'll find. It's really a data-driven approach. And the hope is that we'll find some other uh, perhaps surprising, but yet consistent patterns that down the line can uh, inform the way that we structure this type of collaborative learning experiences in classrooms. Okay, so now I'm happy to pause and answer any questions. There's one from Ola in the chat box. Do you want me to read it out loud? Uh, sure, please. Okay. In the previous results, I wonder whether there is a way in the cross-brain synchrony effects to dissociate the effects of the shared variance and similarity in students' responses to how engaging the content is from the interpersonal effects in learning, how students respond to each other. Yeah, so that, thank you, Ola, for asking that question. So that's really, allows me to, to talk a bit more about how we think about brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. And the honest answer is that we do not, as I already mentioned, we do not have a full understanding of what generates brain synchrony in classrooms. So I'll try to um, present this slide and to that also answer Ola's question. So we think that at the most basic level, brain-to-brain -brain synchrony is driven by a shared input. So just the fact that as of now, um, you are listening to my voice, that by itself can generate brain-to-brain -brain synchrony between um, different people on this Zoom call uh, because um, you know, we all have the same um, neural machinery in our brains. And uh, when we are exposed to the same stimulus that has a, a temporal structure that by itself can generate similar brain activity patterns across participants. However, what I think that this data and also data from other research groups suggest is that brain synchrony it goes above and beyond just the shared stimulus because it's modulated by attention or by engagement. So as I um, try to demonstrate when students are more engaged, um, we see higher brain synchrony between students or between students and teachers. And that translates perhaps to better learning. If brain-to-brain -brain synchrony was a mere reflection of the fact that all the students are exposed to the same input, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see this 
attention modulations. Um, so, so the way that we think about it is such that when students are highly engaged, their brains become more entrained to the input and that uh, has been shown uh, in many other studies and, and that really allows their brain activity to become better aligned. Um, so going back to um, Ola's question, it's really hard as of now to really tease apart what contributes to brain synchrony. Um, is it the, the really truly the social interaction between students? Is it the fact that they uh, just listen to one another or look at the same objects or interact with these objects? Um, for that, we perhaps really need to go back to the laboratory and run a more controlled experiment to try and tease, tease apart these different contributions. Any other questions so far? Sipi has one that says, but can it be that the off task becomes as new on task? So Sipi, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question. Do, do you want to unmute yourself and clarify or just? Um, so, in your slide, in your previous slide, you showed that these uh, students were talking about a ribosome or whatever experiment that they were working on, but then one of them said that she's tired, which kind of shifted the conversation, as you said, to an off-task kind of uh, situation. But the other replies to her comment were related to the same topic, and so maybe they're off task as you define it, but then they are on a new task. And so I'm wondering um, whether their brain synchronization is actually, maybe it's a little bit different, but they're still synchronized because they are communicating on a similar topic and not, you know, one is talking about one thing and another one is not even paying attention. Does it make sense? It does, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Thank you, CP, for asking that. Yeah, so how do we define on task, off task, right? This is clearly subjective. It depends on the task. It depends on the point of reference. Um, so in, in my conversation with um, Sarah and her team, we really went back and forth and tried to, um, to define these terms. It, what makes it even more complex in this case is that students will not only talking to one another, but they were also manipulating objects. And in some cases, their conversation, what they were saying seemed to be on task, but their action seemed to be off task. Um, so so is, can we consider that as on task or off task? It's unclear. So we ended up um, classifying a verbal communication separately than um, physical actions. Um, and on top of that, what seems to be off task on the outside might be on task when you look at it more closely. And also, I don't want to make the claim that off task is necessarily bad. In fact, there is some research showing that off task interactions within group learning can be beneficial and allow students later on to regroup and, and make some progress towards the learning goal. Um, so, Clearly more open questions than answers at this point. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the question, CP. Uh, I see some other questions. Um, There's two more questions. I don't know if you want to take this. Uh, yeah. Chacha says, early on in the talk, you mentioned that during high engagement, alpha waves are suppressed. What frequency bands did you find had the most power during uh, high, stu high, uh, high student engagement? Yeah, that's a, a really good question as well. Um, so let me go back to this slide. So, so perhaps if I understand correctly, the question gets to the fact that alpha brain activity, in this case, it was defined as eight to 12 Hertz, also happens to be the strongest signal in EEG. Um, so, so it kind of becomes the chicken and the egg question because it's unclear if we see these relatively strong effects only for alpha, is that just a reflection of the, of the signal to noise and the fact that, e, that EG 
a power in the alpha band ha happens to be much higher than other frequency bands. Um, so, so we do not know if that's the reason or not, but um, again, it builds on previous research suggesting that uh, alpha is um, tightly related to, to engagement and attention. And I'll show you some more data about that um, in a few slides when we looked at uh, learning in virtual environments. Um, but yeah, if the question, if I understand the question correctly, yeah, so, so alpha band definitely has the most power uh, compared to other bands. And that's where we typically see um, the strongest effects when it comes to brain synchrony between students. However, I do want to emphasize that, that there is an inverse relationship between power and synchrony. So as you see in this slide, um, alpha, synch uh, alpha power goes down when students are engaged, but synchrony goes up. So it's not the case that we see higher synchrony just because there is more power in the EEG. Power actually goes down when students are more engaged. Just to follow up more on um, alpha, one more question from James. Uh, he missed the first part, but is your alpha index derived from one electrode or have you looked at alpha coherence across multiple leads within one individual or coherence across multiple lead across subjects? He's uh, interested in kind of any in real analysis of alpha. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that relates to this analysis where we looked both at intrabrain synchrony and across brain synchrony. So typically the way that we compute brain to brain synchrony is we look at the same electrode across two brains. So we collate O1 in one brain with O1 in the other brain. However, um, other researchers also looked at a one to all synchrony where you collate O1 in student A with all the other electrodes in student B's brain. And we tried that and the results actually didn't change much. And that might have to do with the low spatial resolution of EEG. But in the interbrain synchrony, I, if I understand your question correctly, James, we, we did exactly that. So we um, computed the coherence between different EEG electrodes within an individual student. Um, and that did not predict learning. Um, that might be due to EEG artifacts that um, are by themselves correlated across EEG channels within an individual. So if um, a student blinks, that's gonna show up on multiple EEG electrodes and can generate synchrony within brains, but not across brains. Um, so, so we tend to think, and this is again, uh, consistent with data from uh, the Hassan lab that brain to brain synchrony might be a, a cleaner measure because it's less sensitive to this um, EEG artifacts that we see within individuals. Great, I think that's it and uh, please move on. Okay, great. Um, so back to where we were. Okay, so one other point that I wanted to make before we move on to virtual learning is that brain-to-brain -brain synchrony is not a unique phenomena to humans. In fact, there were uh, two papers recently on brain-to-brain -brain synchrony in bats and rats. This uh, slide is taken from one of these. Um, so in this case, um, the Yaltsev uh, group at Berkeley recorded both spikes and local field potential simultaneously from two bats that were socially interacting with one another. And they were able to demonstrate that these bats exhibit a highly correlated neural activity across different time scales from seconds to minutes, which co-varied with the degree of social interaction between bats. So clearly not unique to humans, um, but I think that in human learners, uh, we can extract some meaningful uh, information and insight from this type of uh, a metric. Um, again, I'm more than happy to talk more about that later. So going back to the talk outline, so far we talked only about brain synchrony in face-to-face -face classrooms, but as we all know, over the past year, um, students learning and as well as our life more generally changed quite um, 
um, abruptly from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual or online learning. And when we think about student engagement in virtual environments, it, there are several uh, interesting questions that come to mind. One, um, it seems that it's harder for, for us as teachers and educators to engage students in online learning. Um, it's also harder to assess student engagement in virtual environments. Um, so uh, typically, especially in, in K-12, uh, you might be looking at one of these Brady Bunch Zoom galleries, but some students don't turn on their video cam, so you already lose a lot of information. But even those students who do have their cameras on, um, we have very limited information on their engagement. Um, so the ty type of rich information that we have in face-to-face -face classrooms where we can look at uh, note-taking and nodding and fidgeting and many other cues that teachers pick up on automatically um, are, are much limited, more constrained in a virtual environment. And the question here is, can we use um, the same portable uh, technologies, not just EEG, but perhaps also eye tracking to gain some insight into student engagement in a uh, virtual learning with the hope that perhaps down the line, we can close the loop and use this information in real time to adapt how information is being presented to students. We're not there yet, but um, we're definitely starting to experiment with that. Um, so this is how uh, one of these um, studies uh, looks like. Um, so this, was, this has been done before the pandemic, but it's even more relevant now. So we recorded EEG activity from individual undergraduate students um, watching instructional videos. And uh, in this case, the content is chemistry. You see the portable EEG cap um, transmitting data wirelessly into a computer as the student was watching a, a pre-recorded video lecture. And critically, these lectures were um, occasionally interrupted with attention probes. Um, so every a minute or two, we ask students to rate their engagement level on a scale. We also ask them a comprehension question, a true or false question. And clearly this engagement or attention probes are informative on one hand, but also um, limited because um, inserting these probes into a lecture can by itself it, it change the engagement level of students. Um, the hope is that down the line, we would be able to replace these probes just with EEG data, but to validate uh, this more objective EEG and perhaps also eye tracking data, we first needed to compare them against the gold standard of student engagement, which currently still remains a self-reported engagement. Um, so I'll just show one snippet of data from this study. We're still finalizing the analysis here, uh, but we looked at EEG power in the 20 second window before each attention probe. And it, we use the median split to uh, basically sort the probes into two groups so of low engagement and high engagement. And as you see here, again, alpha eight to 12 Hertz is the only frequency band within the EEG that significantly discriminated between probes where students reported low engagement to probes where students reported high engagement. Specifically, um, consistent with what I just said earlier, alpha power was a uh, higher when students reported not being engaged in the video compared to when they reported being highly engaged in the video. And what is, um, I, what I find interesting about this result is that, again, we're not looking at EEG power throughout the entire lecture. We look at EEG power in the, in the specific time window just before we ask students how engaged they are. And, and again, it seems that EEG power in the alpha band is a, a close proxy of attention. And the hope is uh, down the line, we can perhaps use this information in real time to um, inform how we present content to students in a online environment, especially uh, this becomes critical for asynchronous learning where um, students and teachers do not interact uh, live. 
and 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 then the information that instructors have on student engagement is really non-existent um, unless we use this kind of um, EEG and perhaps also eye tracking measures to gain some insights into how students engage with this virtual content. In another project that we just started, and this is led by my postdoc, Noah Glazer, we're starting to use virtual reality to look into student engagement. And what gets us excited about virtual reality is that it allows us to simulate a relatively realistic looking classroom and yet uh, maintain full experimental control. Um, so unlike the classroom uh, studies that I mentioned earlier where we have very limited control on the environment in a virtual reality uh, classroom, you can control basically everything. You can control the content, you can control what other students are doing, you can control some um, background noises and, and distractors. Um, and in addition to looking at student behavior, we can also measure their uh, eye movement. So these uh, VR headsets come with a built-in eye tracker. We can also put them on top of it on EEG cap and measure um, students' brain activity as they um, navigate through this environment. And this is a quick video. Um, we're still developing this VR classroom, but you see how um, you see how the classroom looks like from the student viewpoint. Um, again, we're still working on getting these other student avatars to look a bit more realistic, but you see that they uh, do move uh, to some extent. And, and then we have the teacher in the front, we have some slides, we have some other um, sensory input from coming from the outside on the walls and so on. Um, so compared just to a student watching a two-dimensional pre-recorded lecture, that seems to be like a more immersive, realistic learning environment. Clearly not, it's not real world, but um, I feel that it's getting closer uh, to what students experience in the real world. And we plan several different experiments that we'll conduct within this environment. And I'm curious if people have some ideas. Now, now is a good time to get this feedback because we're now designing these experiments. Um, one idea is to manipulate the level of a uh, distract distractor. So we plan to insert distractors into this environment and manipulate the level. So perhaps in some part of the lecture, um, there are not gonna be many distractors. In other parts, there are gonna be some announcements over the PA system, some students coming in and out, some students shattering the background. Um, and, and the goal is to look at how that interacts with the type of instruction. So, for instance, when we use active learning and students not just listen to a lecture, but also answer prompts and, um, and, and actively think about, about the content, do they to some extent become more immune to these um, external distractors? Okay, so um, with that, um, I want to conclude with some more general thoughts about this um, relationship between education and neuroscience. And after that, open the floor to any additional questions. So feel free to type them in, in the chat as we go. Um, so A Bridge Too Far is the title of a highly cited a paper by John Broyer from 1997, where the main claim was that neuroscience and education are simply not aligned well enough to be integrated in any meaningful, productive way. Um, and, and the reason is that in neuroscience, we typically follow a reductionist approach. We ask questions like what specific brain regions are involved in a specific cognitive function. We study these questions in a relatively a artificial environment, like inside an MRI brain scanner. And this is quite different than how um, education researchers act, where in education, we typically were interested in how learners are embedded in a social cultural context. Um, we're interested in, in studying learning where, when and where it, it, it is taking place in the real world using tools like 
observations and interviews and perhaps surveys. Um, so clearly very different goals, very different research traditions that make this integration challenging. And in the past year since this paper was published, there is um, lots of interest on one hand, but also a lot of skepticism on the extent to which neuroscience and education research can be integrated. And what I was hoping to demonstrate throughout this talk is that perhaps with this newer portable uh, brain and eye tracking technologies, there is a new opportunity here to better align research across neuroscience and education, because now we can bring neuroscience research outside of the artificial laboratory context into more uh, realistic real world learning. It doesn't have to be a, a real classroom. It can also be a virtual classroom as I just demonstrated. Um, so the question here is, is it still a bridge too far? Um, it might be, but I hope that we are making this bridge a bit more reinforced and a bit more feasible uh, with these uh, new tools and new methods. Um, however, I do want to say that there are some ethical concerns when it comes to using EEGs and uh, neuroscience methods more generally in schools, concerns related to student privacy, to misuse of brain data. Uh, what you see on the slide is a, a video article from the Wall Street Journal on how EEGs are being used in some parts of the world where um, for instance, in China, where there is already a growing number of classrooms equipped with these um, low-cost portable devices, uh, where students and teachers, um, sorry, where teachers and parents um, monitor student engagement and attention. In real time, parents get notifications to their cell phones about their um, student um, attention and learning. Um, student um, grades are affected by that. And that really became children's worst nightmares. <laughs> um, and this is concerning because clearly this technology by no means can give any meaningful information about individual learning. As I mentioned, EEG is noisy and we're not yet at a point where we can make any meaningful claims about individual student learning. And yet um, this is how this technology is being used in some cases. So that's something that we want to be mindful of. And, um, and I'm hoping that that will trigger some discussion within our community and with educators, parents, policymakers, and so on. So with that, I want to acknowledge the many different people who contributed this work, primarily my colleagues at NYU, David Popper, Susanna Dicker, and others, and my newer colleagues here at UConn, um, as well as my funding sources. And thank you so much for having me here today, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. This is great. Um, there's a comment by Karen. That was fantastic, by the way. I was really amazed by the uh, the last news article. It was uh, I can see it happening, and especially in some Asian countries. And coming from Asia myself, but uh, that's very fascinating and concerning. So here's a comment from Karen. Uh, thank you for noting the neuroethical issues, a very important conversation to have as imaging neurotech AI develop, uh, develops and get implemented in ways that neuroscientists may not be aware of. Yes, I think there's a big wave 10, 15 years ago on neuroethics and how when we started, for example, I was often kind of asked when we publish data on uh, machine learning and how we can predict outcome and use it as biomarkers. And then a lot of the news caught on. We got emails and contacts from India and other places if we would scan their sun to predict the future as though I had a crystal ball in my hand now. And so this is kind of a very similar kind of area, but uh, it's very fascinating. Thank you. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. I know we have four more minutes. I asked you a bunch of questions already in my previous, when you gave a talk previously, so I'll let other people ask. I think we're getting comments that it was an excellent talk, but uh, no questions? I, it's, it's, That's, I, I can just say, oh yeah, please go ahead, Sandra. Um, yeah, I was just, I was fascinated, I was fascinated by the bats um, the social, social interactions of bats, and also potentially social interactions between people that might tell you if they're in sync or they're, they're actually experiencing something similar together. 
and I'm reminded that Jonathan Downer and, and Baylor was beginning to be interested in having people in the fMRI set up um, carrying out similar tasks between different scanners to see if, if you could actually see some kind of communication energy that was being uh, transmitted. Um, so it's obviously easier to do it with an EEG, but are there sort of any thoughts about actually seeing when people are like enjoying something together or they're, they're having different reactions to the same uh, information? And, uh, we don't know how to read what that means, but even just this idea that there are, you know, there's kind of group think or group uh, responses that you know one might capture including good and bad just wondered yeah yeah thank you for um for noticing that so yeah when i was at princeton i was actually involved in a hyper scanning uh, mri study where we use two different scanners simultaneously we scanned two people as they were having a conversation um it was a very challenging setup, as you can imagine, a very challenging data set to analyze. I think that Uri Hassan and uh, Talia Whitley and others um, still do work in this field. I kind of transitioned to do this um, more real world EEG type of research. Um, and yeah, like you, Sandra, I also find it fascinating that this phenomena is observed also in animals and um, Perhaps there might be some opportunities to do cross-species uh, cross research around brain synchrony. Um, so I can I can echo your um, fascination by this. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, finding some bats. Um, okay, two. Um, there's some comments, but just getting to the last two questions, if you have time, just quickly. Can, so I'll say the two questions. Can you identify the source of the alpha activity in this technology? I mean, I, I sort of know the answer, but if you want to add something, which parts of the brain science salience network was one question. Um, Karen Davis, the other one is from Ola. Could you use the subtraction method? Two people viewing stimuli minus one person viewing stimuli. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll try to answer these questions quickly. So the first one by Karen. Um, so it alpha, EG alpha activity seems to be localized in the posterior part of the brain. Um, in fact, the data that I showed from the pre-recorded lectures, so that was only a, a posterior set of electrodes with the effects were much weaker in other uh, um, ROIs, regions of interest that we looked at. It might as well be um, salience, alertness, um, as well as attention engagement, it's a bit hard to tease those apart. Um, yeah, but I would imagine that if we would also scan the students' brains, uh, the salience uh, network that we typically see in fMRI would light up. Um, as of the other question on using subtraction, um, yeah, so I'm not sure about subtracting one condition from another, but definitely comparing synchrony across conditions. So um, it's very hard to just say if Absolutely, there is synchrony between individuals or not. Um, you can run some permutation tests and look into the statistical significance, but for the most part, we want to compare synchrony levels across multiple conditions. And it's always helpful to have a baseline condition where it's just one person viewing stimuli versus, in fact, we were about to run this study just before the pandemic started. So just one person viewing a video compared to two people watching the same video together. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll get back there uh, after the pandemic. So yeah, so, so the answer to that is yes, but not necessarily via subtraction. Great, okay, there's one more question, but I don't, do know you need to go. So I'm gonna let you go, but I'll send you the question, Ido, later. And then Stefan Sloda, if you don't mind sending us your email, I'm happy to forward it to Ido and I'm sure he'll be, oh, he wrote his email. So please do send him an email directly, even better. All right, great. Thank you very much, everyone. In several weeks, we'll resume with the speakers that we spoke about. Thank you so much. It was very engaging and exciting.